And as we said, tonight's Bible study, the title is The Lessons of Balaam. And if you could, if you could, I'd like to uh, open in prayer. If we could just bow our heads for just a moment. Lord, at this particular time that we come before you for a time of being with you and your word to have our understanding and our hearts opened that you might be able to do more with us according to that perfect purpose and perfect will and according to your perfect ways, almighty God. And what we ask tonight is that the teacher would not be an obstacle or a stumbling block, an object in the way, but truly a vessel, a conduit that he would be able to usher forth your word and that your word would not return unto you void, but accomplish, accomplish that to what you send it to do in our lives. That is our prayer when we come before you tonight for tonight's Bible study, Lord. And we thank you so much for the greatness and the awesomeness just to behold you, God, to be counted worthy to come before you by the precious blood of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We pray and claim in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, uh, I'll, I'll be a little honest, I'm a little stirred up tonight. There's so much material here and it's impossible to cover it in 30 minutes and I'm not taking more than what my assignment is. Well, not if I take a little a little bit, not too much more. And so tonight we're going to talk about one of those legends, one of those uh, uh, almost cartoonish things in the Bible. There is an episode in this story where there is something that is, it is as huge as Noah being swallowed up by the great fish, the Bible calls it, we call it a whale swallowed up. It is that type of story that we are going to talk about. But there's several lessons in here for all the Christians. And so our setting, our background is that Israel was coming to the end of their 40 years that they were assigned into the wilderness. And just quickly, just quickly, all that came about because of one decision. God told them, I have this promised land for you. And when the spies went out and said, oh, this is what it looks like. These are the things that are there. The people, well, two of the spies and 10 of the spies discourage the hearts of the entire nation, of the entire nation. And God said, that's it. All righty. If you're saying that your children will be a prey, they will be the only ones who go in. That one decision of complaining and murmuring and disobeying God costs them not only 40 years of wandering, but it costs those people to miss out and the children to go in. They completely missed the promise of God because they complained against God and against Moses. Completely missed what God had for them. Completely. Because they chose to be, let's just say, disobedient and not to believe the God who delivered them with a great hand would continue to deliver them. So that is the setting. They're coming to the end of that 40 years. And if you were uh, following, uh, as we, we had our, our reading for the month and we were going through the book of Numbers, it was Numbers this month. And if you were following with us, you would, you would have seen that they had many battles in, the, in that wilderness and some were internal battles and some were external battles. So let's pick up. Let's join with this lesson in Numbers chapter 21 and verse 23. We're going to be going over a lot of scriptures today. That's the only way to tell this story where you can go back and retrieve this and be able to take it into your bosom and let God teach you more and more and more from it. So from the book of Numbers chapter 21 and starting at verse number 23. And Sihon would not suffer Israel to pass through his border, but Sihon gathered all his people together and went out against Israel into the wilderness. 
and he came to Jahaz and fought against Israel. Now, just one moment there. So the setting for this part is now that they're coming to the end of the 40s, they're about to go to the land of promise. And as they are about to do this, they asked this king, Sihon, they'd asked uh, another one too, uh, but now they're asking King Sihon, uh, hey, look, we want to be able to go through. We're not going to take anything that you got, not going to eat your grass. We're not going to drink your water. We're not going to touch anything you got. But we just want to go on past so we can get to where the Lord is leading us. And Sihon said, no, no. Matter of fact, matter of fact, all my people is coming out. We're going to fight you. This is going to be a war. Verse number 24. And Israel smote him with the edge of the sword and possessed his land from Arnon unto Jabbok, even unto the children of Ammon, for the border of the children of Ammon was strong. In verse 25, and Israel took all those cities, and Israel dwelt in all the cities of the Amorites. This is what Sihon was, an Amorite, in Heshboth and in all the villages thereof. For Heshbon was the city of Sihon, the king of the Amorites, who had fought against the former king of Moab. The former king of Moab. That's important. That's important. So Sihon fought against Moab and won and took all his land out of his hand, even unto Arnon. So Israel, when journeying to get to their uh, uh, promised land, they encountered other peoples and cultures, and here they encountered the Amorites. And just, it doesn't say a whole lot about the Amorites here, but if we could go over to the book of Amos, chapter 2, and verse number 9. It says here, the Lord speaking through the prophet Amos, yet destroyed I the Amorites before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks, yet I destroyed his fruit from above, and his roots from beneath. Also I brought you up, to, up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. Height like cedar trees. In other words, these were big people, strong as Oaks. In other words, they weren't just big, they were strong people. And we just read how they said, no, we're not going to let you buy. And Israel not only smote them, but they took their land. So this shows the victory that God had within those who follow his will. Now, did this mean that Israel was righteous? Prior to this, if we were to read earlier, but we don't have time, but if we were to read earlier in that chapter 21, uh, when Israel complained against God and Moses, because they complained again, they complained against God and Moses that they were out there and they wanted water. That time, God didn't even answer them. He just sent fiery serpents. And those fiery serpents was going on, and they were killing, killing people in Israel. And so all of a sudden now, okay, you send in a fiery serpent. So God, we know we done done wrong. So God, uh, please, uh, please stop, please. And so they went over to Moses and they appealed and Moses made a brazen serpent and that serpent that, they, that he made, they had to look on it whenever they would get bit by one of those fiery serpents and they would be saved. Yeah, that, that brazen serpent that is also in the gospels that the Lord Jesus referred back to, that's the serpent that he made because of their rebellion and they lost thousands through that complaining against God and against his, the man. Lesson number one, the God of Israel was stronger than the gods of the land. The God of Israel was stronger than the, God of the, the gods of the land. Uh, now the Amorites, they were actually a conglomerate of uh, cultures, but they all were of that blood. And these Amorites, they, not all of them worshiped the same God, but to fight the one battle, they would all come together and get together, and then they would all go out and fight together. So Numbers chapter 22, if we go to chapter 22, 
we, in verse number two, we see here, and Balak, starting at verse number two, I'm sorry, and Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. So Balak, this, 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 this guy is going to talk about him being a king, but this guy, he saw the battle of the Amorites and Israel. He saw that. And Moab was sore afraid of the people because they were many, and Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. Anytime you see a big battle like that, you were like, man, I don't want to fight those people. Okay, so Moab has a decision to make. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, now shall this company lick up all that are round about us as the, ox, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at the time. Now, remember, there was some of the people of Moab whom the Amorites beat and took their stuff. And now Israel came and beat the Amorites. So if there were Moabites that lost to the Amorites and Israel beat the Amorites, they don't want to fight those people. Okay? And so uh, in verse number five, it says that he sent messengers, therefore unto Balaam, the son of, Baal, ba the son of Baor, to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. That's 40 years ago. 40 years ago, they are remembering what God had done to the, to the Egyptians for these people. And he is remembering them. And he says, so he says to, to, to Balaam, he says, they're come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee and curse me this people. For they are too mighty for me. Peradventure, I shall prevail that we may smite them and that I may drive them out of the land for I what not or I know not. I know that he whom thou blessest is blessed and he whom thou cursest is cursed. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. Divination, meaning they had some good money. They had some good uh, jewels and, and things that were valuable to take to them, to persuade them. And they came unto Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balak. And he said unto them, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you word again. As the Lord speaketh unto me, and the princess of Moab abode, in, and the princess of Moab abode with Balaam. And God came unto Balaam and said, what men are these with thee? So we see here that the Moabites went to some man, to Balaam, to ask him. They say, I know that whoever you curse is cursed and whoever you bless is blessed. So we want you to go ahead and curse this people because we know when you do it, it'll be done. And God speaks to that guy who said he was going to go and talk to God. How in the world could that be that the Lord speaks to this guy? Didn't he have to be in Israel and the line of the prophets for God to speak to him and him to find out what God says? The truth is, the truth is, God is God over the whole earth. And he's the only one. So lesson number two. God is God over the whole earth and chooses whom he will. Very important, very important. And you know, sometimes uh, religious people can get that part wrong in thinking, well, God can't use you unless you do what I think you're supposed to do. No, 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 no. God is God. There is only one God. And let's face it, none of us knew God until God showed us him, no matter where we came from. And God, the Almighty, has been speaking to people down through the ages. They can't say that I was born unrighteous and I never had a chance. No, God even gave provision to become part of Israel. 
but you didn't have to be, whenever anybody says, and I just got to throw this in here, whenever anybody says, what about the people in the deep, darkest parts of wherever? What about the people we didn't hear about over in the Orient or over in uh, the Slavic country? What about all those people down in South America or wh wh wherever? God is God over them too. And his ways are so much higher than ours. We can ask a question we don't know the answer to, but he knows the answer to, and he said, all souls are mine. So from the book of 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse number 7, the Bible says, the Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among the princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillar of the earth are the Lord's. And he hath set the world upon them. In other words, God says, I choose who's to be rich and who to be poor. I choose what to do with people's lives. I choose to how I'm going to speak to people. And in, and in Jeremiah chapter 27, uh, verse number 6. And now have I given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. So God says he gave Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, all the, the, those lands. And then he says, the king of Babylon. And then he says, my servant. And the beasts of the field have I given him also to serve him. And all nations shall serve him. And his son and his son's son until the very time of his land come. And then many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of him. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar didn't just get that, what he had. God, even him, gave him that entire landscape for God's purpose. So God chooses whom he will. And religious people have to make sure, and I'm, I'm saying, okay, me being a religious person, I'll just make it myself. Me being a religious person, I have to make sure that I don't get it wrong in thinking somewhere along the line that I could have a monopoly on God's will and his way or his word. I don't have a step up in God because of anything except for his grace. If he gives grace to do such, then I have that grace to do it. Outside of that, I am under the same umbrella as everybody else. Without his redemption, we are all in the same pool. Um, if he will, he could use a beast to speak, if he so wills it. We're talking about the Almighty. And so, uh, Numbers 22, verse 10. And Balaam said unto God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, hath sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them. Peradventure I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. They are are blessed. Verse 13. And Balaam rose up in the morning and said unto the princes of Balak, Get you into your land, for the Lord refuseth to give me leave to go with you. Please notice how he says this. He didn't say, The Lord said no. He said, The Lord refuses to give me the permission to go with you. He refuses to let me go. It's just like a kid who wants to do something and mommy or daddy says, nope. And he goes back out to tell his friends, my mom, my dad, they won't, won't let me come out and play today. So this is akin to the attitude. You have to, you have to look because it's about to get where, and, and uh, hopefully we can learn from this lesson. Um, and verse 15. 
And Balak sent yet again princes more and more honorable than they, and they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus saith Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me. For I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now please, again, look at his speech. If Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold. Why silver and gold? The Bible says from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So this would have caught, you get this, this would have caught Balaam's eye. Uh, anyway, and it goes into verse number, where are we at? Uh, so we're at verse 19. Now, therefore, I pray you, tarry ye also here this night, that I may know what the Lord will say unto me more. Uh, there's a question here. And the question is, why is he seeking God on this matter when God already told him no? Why is he saying, well, I'll go back to God again when God already told him? Lesson number three, how easy it is to take a relationship with God for granted. How easy it would be to do that. Verse uh, number 20, and God came to Balaam at night and said unto him, if the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, thou shalt do. Yet the word I shall say unto thee, thou shalt do. And so the question is, of course, what does Balaam do? And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. Wait a minute. What did, what did God tell him to do? He said, God said, if they come to call on you, Go. In the morning, Balaam just got up and went. Just got up and went. Oh, it'll be all right. God said I could go if they come and call. I just won't wait for them to call. I'll just go anyway. I'll just, you know, it's going to be all right. God won't, it won't make a big deal to God. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, verse number 22. And God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass, and his two servants were with him. Verse number 23. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. And Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. Verse number 24, but the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself into the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff. Okay? And verse number 28, this is, this is one of those uh, famous parts of the story, of course. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill thee. And the ass said unto Balaam, 
am not I thine ass upon, upon which thou hast written ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever want to do so unto thee? And he said, nay. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and a sword drawn in his hand and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said, wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee because thy way is perverse before me. Now we have a situation where Balaam is talking to the ass and the ass is talking back. We have here where uh, the angel of the Lord is also talking, but that guy has a sword drawn ready to smite and telling him that he was set to slay him, but the ass saved his life. So the question is, was Balaam righteous in any of this? And the answer is no, no, he was not. And yet God was still able to use even that which was unrighteous. God already knew how his judgment would fall. But yes, Balaam was wrong and God could still use this man for a teaching lesson for Israel, for Israel. Verse number 23. And the ass saw me and turned from me these three times, unless she had turned from me. Surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. Lesson number four. There is no replacement for obedience. It is easy to assume that because God has blessed us, that we are exempt or somehow more special, so that you don't have to obey him because he has shown you favor. There is no replacement for obedience. Numbers 24, uh, we're skipping down. Uh, we're gonna be running out of time here in a few minutes. So we're skipping down and we're going down to Numbers 24, 23, the last part of it. And, uh, and uh, here before this, uh, Balaam had a parable, and in that parable, God had given him prophetic things to say, even up until, until uh, about Shallow coming, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he took up this parable and said, Alas, who shall live when God doeth this? And ships shall come from the coast of Chittim, and shall afflict Asher, and shall afflict Eber, and he also shall perish forever. And Balaam rose up and went and returned to his place. And Balak also went his way. That's the end of 24. So he couldn't curse him. He got rebuked and corrected. And here, here in chapter 25, the very next verse, the very next verse, we see verse number one, and Israel abode in Shedem, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. So he went from, I can't curse these people. God's only, only given me this much permission. And the next thing we read is Israel committing, the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. That's not all of it. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself to Baal Peor. Now Baal Peor uh, is a god, but this particular god, you can see Baal is the first part of that. This particular god is supposed to be a great and mighty god who does not hold his people accountable. A great and mighty god who does not hold his people accountable. They just come to him, give him stuff, and then he's supposed to be the good god to them. And that payor, that payor part, that is for, um, how can I say this politely? It has sexual connotations. 
so it is to it is to infer that this is a God that won't hold you accountable for your actions. That's when they would go and look to Baal Peor because they could get away with stuff. And the second part of that verse is, so the first part, and Israel joined himself to Baal Peor. The second part is, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Lesson number five, the spirit of Balaam. There is a spirit of Balaam. When an adversary can't come against the righteous, against the righteous God in your life, they seek to tempt or distract you with sin, weakness, or a stumbling block. With sin, or one of your weaknesses, or a flat out stumbling block, something they know you're going, you would be drawn to. Now, uh, you see what uh, Balaam used for this? Specifically, he used two things. He used fornication and idolatry. Bold, loud, unrepented, unashamed fornication and idolatry. That's what Baal Peor is, a god of sex with no limit, no accountability. Numbers uh, 25 and verse number four. So the Lord is not just uh, a little angry, he's hot. And God says, and the Lord said unto Moses, take all the heads of the people and hang them before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. I'm on the last and I see I've got to hurry up. I only got a couple of minutes left. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. Everybody who got caught out there, wipe them out. In verse number six. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation at a time when there was repentance that should have been shown, there was somebody who was bold enough to go before the leader of the nation, the one who talked to God face to face. And actually he was a prince. And so was she, she was a princess. So they figured, hey, I'm pretty high on the, the rung of the ladder. So, you know, I got this, I'm, I'll show everybody. And verse number seven, and when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into his tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly so the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. Verse number nine, and those that died in the plague were 24,000 people, 24,000 tempted and succumbed to this God to do the things that this God said was okay to do. Lesson number six, lesson number six, just because you have one victory doesn't mean you have let the devil go. Just because you have one victory doesn't mean you have let the devil go. Let, let's show how thorough this um, spirit, this uh, uh, mark of Balaam was. Um, so it talks about it in Revelations chapter two. Let's go over to that right quick. Revelations chapter two, and we're just gonna read the last one, and that's verse 14. Uh, if you get a chance, you would mark down 12 through 14, but in verse 14, he's talking to the church of Pergamos, and he says, but I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. 
in the church of Pergamos, in the church of Pergamos. They allowed that spirit to go. Uh, so, let's see, I got about, I got about three minutes. I'm gonna have to cut that part out. Uh, so Numbers 31, verses eight and nine, it says here, and they slew the kings of Midian beside the rest of them that were slain, namely Evi, Rechem, Zer, Hur, Reba, five kings of Midian. Balaam also the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. And that lets you know where his affinity was. Yeah, God was speaking to him. Yeah, God showed him some lessons. Yeah, God taught him things. Yes, God had made him to be one who was known throughout the land, and he still had his affinity towards the things of the world. Uh, and verse number nine. And the children of Israel took all the women of Midian captives and their little ones and took the spoil of all the cattle and all the flocks and all the goods. That wasn't what the commission was. Skip down to verse 14. And Moses was wroth with the officers of the host and with the captains over thousands and the captains over hundreds, which came from the battle. And Moses said unto them, have ye saved all the women alive? Uh, I've saved all the women, uh, I'm sorry. Verse number 16. Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespasses against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Lesson seven, our last lesson. There are corrupt teachers and preachers and prophets, singers, workmen, and so much more who are anointed and blessed of the Lord. And yet they take those blessings, they take those gifts and talents, they take those special things that the Lord has given them and they use them for vile purposes, fleshly gain and to snare or cast stumbling blocks to others. In other words, there's I once, uh, I'll tell the story right quick. I once was, uh, many years ago, I was at work, and a, fr a friend that I had been sharing with, he told me he was going to go to this church. And I was like, oh, you're, gonna, you're going to church? And he said, yeah, I'm going to join the choir. And I was like, really? He said, yeah, I figured I'd give my voice to the Lord, see what he could do with it, and then I'll go out and try and make some money with it. Straight out. Straight out. Now, we know many people, they start off in the church, and then, you know, gold and silver and money and everything looks so sweet to have. This is the lesson. This is the lesson not to be beguiled and love the wages of unrighteousness like Balaam did. Last, last verse. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh but by love serve but by love serve one another amen the bible study for tonight give the lord a praise